The final presentation of day one of 120 is, is an interesting one. It's uh, volcanic hazards and subsea cables. Now, I've, I've had the good fortune to have had a preview of this, this talk before already and it's it's a it's a really good one there's some really interesting stuff here so we're we're pleased to have michael claire from ocean ocean bias geoscience uh, to join us here and he's uh, going to give his talk now great stuff well thanks very much for the invite um hands up if you were at uk nof a few weeks ago Right, I suggest you all get to the bar early. You might have seen this before. I am very conscious I stand between you and uh, all the important networking that you're going to be doing. Um, so yeah, this presentation, we, we gave a version of this presentation, myself and my colleague Isabel Yeo. Uh, we're both based at the National Oceanography Centre in the UK. Um, and so we're ocean scientists. Isabel is a volcanologist. I study natural hazards and things that happen underneath the sea. So you may be asking the question, why is this at links? And hopefully during this presentation, we'll give some explanation of why this event that we're going to talk about is important, um, but also why understanding natural hazards is important uh, to, to keeping the internet resilient and keeping it running. Uh, we thank a, a kind of a football team worth of authors here from collaborations. And really what I want to stress at the beginning and throughout this presentation is the research that we're doing here is necessarily collaborative. By going to the ocean and understanding things like natural hazards, uh, we need uh, multiple different countries, we need big seagoing infrastructure, um, but this project has really benefited from collaborations with organisations like the International Cable Protection Committee, from, from Tonga Cable Limited, uh, Google and others. Um, and so hopefully in this presentation I'll give you an idea of how we're better understanding our planet as a result of the internet infrastructure like subsea cables um, and also hopefully how the research that we're doing is making sure that that infrastructure remains resilient. I'm sure all of you know this already but this was a surprise to me when I started getting involved in in discussions with uh, telecoms companies but you know there's a network of more than 1.4 million kilometers of cables that cross the global ocean uh, most of these are no wider diameter than a hose pipe here's a, a section of a transatlantic cable but 19 millimeters in diameter there's more than 400 cable systems that carry just over 99% of all digital data traffic that's transmitted worldwide. So this is trillions of dollars a day in financial transactions. As you know, it's underpinning the internet. Um, and so just shown here schematically is the telegeography map of subsea cables centered on the Pacific Ocean, which you can see is relatively underserved by subsea cables. Um, and then the, the yellow, orange and red circles represent earthquakes that have been historically recorded around the world. Just one of a number of hazards that face the cables that cross the ocean. And indeed, each year, there's on average between about 150 to 200 instances of damage, so cable faults that lead to an outage on this global network. Most of these, uh, between 60 to 70 percent, relate to human activities, so accidental interactions with fishing gear uh, or anchor drops. So these happen in relatively shallow water, they can be relatively quickly repaired, and they only affect a very small amount of the cable. Natural hazards, things like underwater landslides, earthquakes, volcanoes, scour by deep sea currents, only account, at least historically, for between about 10 and 20% of all cable faults that have been recorded. But when they do happen, when things like tropical cyclones, like tropical cyclone tip here shown, uh, the Tohoku Oki earthquake on the bottom right there in 2011 that struck off the coast of Japan, when these events happen, they can be quite distinct because they can have huge spatial footprints, which means that they can wipe out multiple cable systems in one go. So synchronously, they can damage multiple different cables, in some cases, tens of cables uh, in instances offshore Taiwan. And natural hazards account for more than a third of all faults that have occurred in deep water. So they're important, and when these impacts can happen, repairs can be hundreds of millions of dollars and they can lead to significant outages, in some cases disconnecting whole regions for periods of time. 
So the research that we've been doing at the National Oceanography Centre and with collaborators has been to try and better understand some of these natural hazards. So you may be aware in 2020, during the, the peak of, of lockdowns, uh, a number of cables that crossed the deep sea Congo Canyon. This is a, an undersea canyon, uh, similar in sort of scale in terms of its cross section to the Grand Canyon but much longer than the Grand Canyon. This system stretches out 1,200 kilometers into deep water down to 5,000 meters water depth. Um, and through this canyon flow avalanches of sand and mud periodically that can reach speeds of up to tens of meters per second. And that's exactly what happened uh, in, uh, in 2020 um, when three cables which crossed the Congo Canyon were sequentially snapped from shallow down into deeper water. So from those cable breaks, we could actually work out how fast these flows were going, which is really neat for us. It's not so neat for the cables. It's not so neat for West to South Africa, whose internet was crippled at that point in time. But we've learned lessons from this project and been working with cable companies to route more resilient routes so there's redundancy in the network so that cables can survive these sorts of instances. And obviously conditions are changing as well. We know that, that global warming and climate change is, is not just affecting uh, the temperature, it's affecting seafloor currents. It's affecting the frequency and magnitude of the sorts of flooding events that, that cause these cable faults in the Congo Canyon. It's also changing coastal erosion and sea level rise, which can affect cable landing stations in different places. Um, so last year we published the first global review of, of looking at the, the future impacts of climate change that might be felt over the engineering lifetime of a project over, say, the next 25 to 40 years. But I'm going to jump from that. Most regions, however, and, and this was a surprise to me, thinking about how big these natural hazards can be, actually that global network is remarkably resilient, and that's because the industry's been doing an awfully good job. It's been experiencing these sorts of natural hazards all the way back since the late 1800s, when the first cables were laid across the Atlantic. So the industry has learned there's redundancy in most of the network, there's ready access for most regions to repair ships, and for many regions, there's sufficient replace, replacement stocks in place. So for these reasons, the network is largely highly resilient. But some areas, some locales are an exception, and the South Pacific is one of those specific areas. So again, here we just show the schematic telegeography map. Um, and then we're going to zoom in here, we're going to take you to, to Tonga. And so this is an island nation which has one cable which connects it to the rest of the world. One international cable which connects from Tonga, from the main island, to Fiji, then on to Australia, and then on to the rest of the internet world. Uh, there's also one domestic cable which serves the Hapai and other island groups to the north. These will become important later on in this talk. So if we zoom into the seafloor at Tonga, and this is four times vertical exaggeration, what we're looking at is bathymetry. So the relief of what the seafloor looks like at the bottom uh, of this part of the South Pacific. And so we can see uh, a deep sea trench running diagonally across, and then a, a load of lumps on the seafloor. And these lumps and bumps are submarine volcanoes. There are many, many submarine volcanoes, some of which are extinct but many of which are active. And on average, there's about one volcano that erupts along this part uh, of this tectonic arc every year. But most of the time, these happen under the water, they're relatively small, and they go pretty unnoticed. So you can see Tonga Tapu, where the capital Nuka'alofa is in Tonga. This is where the international cable connects onto Fiji. Uh, and then you'll see the, the yellow uh, rectangle and arrow pointing to a volcano which became famous in 2022 in January, Hunga Tonga, Hunga Hapai, which fortunately for me uh, has now been renamed Hunga Volcano. So that will make life a lot easier in this talk. So in December, this volcano started erupting. And then on January the 14th, it started doing this. And this looks pretty dramatic. But according to Izzy that I work with, this is actually pretty boring and low level explosivity. This is a volcanic explosivity index of one, kind of the lowest on the scale it reaches. So this was so pretty that islanders went out there. They, they shot this incredible footage. They flew drones around it, took tourists out. And, and this is considered pretty normal in a part of the world which is volcanically active. To me, it looks genuinely terrifying, and I wouldn't put a vessel anywhere near it. But for those guys, this is pretty normal. And you can see the two islands have actually been joined together. We could see from satellite footage going all the way back from November through to January. And January the 15th, the two islands 
were joined together as the volcano started to rise from below the sea surface. And then at some point here on just before January the 15th, a piston dropped out the bottom. Uh, and this was really going to tell us something about what was about to come. But this is Tonga Geological Services, the equivalent of what we have as the British Geological Survey in the UK. Um, they were out the day before the big eruption happened, and this is how happy and confident they were. This volcano was about to take everybody completely by surprise. So what happened on January the 15th, early in the morning, was a huge eruption, the largest and most explosive eruption that we've ever recorded instrumentally, perhaps bigger than 1991 in Pinatubo, um, and certainly the biggest underwater volcano that happened since Krakatoa in Indonesia went in the late 1800s. It was visible from space, it created a pressure wave that went more than three times around the world, creating tsunamis that kill people as far away as Peru. So a really incredible event. But locally, some incredible observations were gathered. This is footage from a fisherman who'd taken some tourists out to see the volcano. It's very shaky, I can't play the audio because of all the swearing in it, but he's basically telling people, please, please put your life jackets on. So he's just experienced the sonic boom, their air, ears have repressurized in a bit, pumice and volcanic rock are about to start falling from the sky before it goes completely black. But that sonic boom created, and hopefully you can see when it starts to stabilize, there's white water the whole way across the horizon. And this is the tsunami wave that was being created by the volcano. Fortunately, these guys got to deeper water where the, volcan where, where the tsunami wave basically becomes lower amplitude, spreads out and went underneath the vessel. But they witnessed this tsunami wave, which in some cases was 45 meters high, making landfall on one of the islands on which they lived. So they didn't know when they got to the island whether anyone was going to be left alive, whether there was uh, how much devastation had happened. Fortunately, the initial tsunami waves which were generated were relatively small waves. Uh, so there's a remarkable amount of smartphone footage that's available from this eruption that's giving us a really great insight into what happened during this event. So here we can see these are relatively small tsunami waves. The tsunami warning system went off the week before the South Pacific had held uh, a South Pacific wide rehearsal of the tsunami warning. So people were really, really well prepared for this event. Unfortunately, only two lives were taken. But ash is falling, they've gone pitch black, there's car alarms going off because of this pressure wave, and in the middle of a crisis, internet stopped. Complete blackout for the internet. And so if we look at the internet traffic, the typical average internet traffic shown in grey here, you can now see the, uh, the blue line, pretty much it goes off a cliff edge and then flat lines. And it flatlined about an hour and 15 minutes after that big, massive eruption, not synchronous with it. And this was hugely important. So this, this cut Tonga off from the internet at a really critical time for disaster response. It was impossible for people to know outside of Tonga how they could deliver aid and get that in. It was impossible for people in Tonga to ask for how they needed aid to be delivered. There were warning systems going off on certain islands that people couldn't contact and people couldn't get in contact with their family and friends to see even if they were still alive. So this is how reliant people are on this infrastructure. Uh, it was four or five days before um, low-level satellite coverage kicked in um, and people could start to make fairly rudimentary communications, less than 1% of the bandwidth that they'd previously been experiencing. And it took five weeks to repair the internet, an international cable that connected the main island of Tonga to the rest of the world. And so this is remarkable. And the only repair ship that was available in the area was in Papua New Guinea. A number of cable companies had to club together to pull together enough spares because it turned out there was a huge extent of damage to the seafloor cable. The domestic cable, the one which runs right up to the north that connects up to the Hapai groups of islands, uh, was only repaired earlier this year and it took 18 months for that repair to happen because of the extent of damage. And that's a remarkable amount of time to be without uh, broadband internet. So 
We discovered from discussions with uh, cable companies, initially Southern Cross and later Tonga Cable Limited, that when the repair vessel had gone to try and find ends of the cable which were not damaged or which weren't buried by volcanic debris, they just had to keep looking and looking and looking and looking. And eventually for the international cable, they found almost 90 kilometers of cable had been damaged or buried. And in the case of the domestic cable, just over 105 kilometers of cable. So these stocks were simply not available. So this explains why the repair took so long. The domestic cable needed to be manufactured from scratch. So I'll Connectivity for Tonga is very important. Um, you may be aware that Tonga, about almost 50% of its GDP is from remittances from families abroad. So when the connection went down, a lot of these, a lot of the people um, missed out on a lot of uh, what they would normally receive as income. And that didn't start to come in. I mean, that was almost a week before there was enough connectivity so the people would start receiving their funds through uh, the banks. And even the banks had difficulty connecting. So it was a big um, business came practically to a standstill. Uh, during that time. So it was quite scary for everybody. So Samisi was out on the golf course at the point at which the uh, tsunami alarms were going off and he, he did at least finish his game of golf. Um, but the, the point that he's making there I think is a really important one. Like more than 50% of Tonga's GDP comes from remittances that are sent from abroad. Businesses couldn't transact. This was a huge deal. So getting this cable repaired was really important. The challenges initially at that time were the volcano had recently exploded. Uh, was it going to explode again? Would it be safe to send in a repair vessel? So we worked with the repair companies to try and pull together a range of volcanologists from around the world to try and identify what sort of standoff distances are appropriate. We also work with Tonga Cable Limited with the International Cable Protection Committee and the Natural Environment Research Council in the UK uh, to get a vessel sent out within uh, just over two months from the eruption to go and survey the seafloor to see what had changed. Um, and this is in collaboration with uh, Niwa from New Zealand. And so in the South Pacific, many areas are very, very poorly surveyed. We have a very poor understanding of what the seafloor looks like in any detail. But this was an exception. This was a place where we had a detailed map, fortunately, beforehand. We were able to send a vessel out, in this case, the Tangaroa on the bottom right, and also an uncrewed surface vessel because nobody was feeling brave enough to go over the top of the volcano itself. So that filled in the gaps. Um, and what we found really took us by surprise. There was 900 meters vertical difference before what there used to be and what there was after in the middle of the volcano. So a hole that was about six to seven cubic kilometers in volume was exploded up into the atmosphere. The eruption column actually reached 57 kilometers into the air. So it reached through the atmosphere and into the mesosphere. And as it collapsed and it plunged back down into the ocean, there was a huge amount of, of dense volcanic rock that was blasted into the sea uh, and it started to carve these blue channels. So what you're seeing here is a three times vertical exaggeration view of the volcano. Areas of blue are where material has been removed, so a big hole in the middle. But also you'll see these, these kind of gullies that come down the side of the volcano. And these are chutes that are up to 120 meters deep. So as deep as Big Ben or whatever the tower that's called that's got Big Ben in it is high, is how deep these flows actually ripped up material from the sea floor. And then as they reach lower angle slopes where the domestic cable is, shown in green here, they dump that load. And then they were steered along the topography, along the relief, um, like snow avalanches are steered through a valley. And this flow ran along the cable, both to the north and the south, explaining this extensive damage to it. We took seafloor cores and we can see big chunks of volcanic debris. And in places, 22 meters of material was dumped on top of the cable. So a small cable like this sadly didn't stand much of a chance. Um, and so our colleagues at, at NIWA, hopefully you can see this, have developed this really beautiful video. Maybe it's not so clear, but hopefully you see there's kind of an avalanche of volcanic material uh, plunging down the seafloor, down the slopes of the volcanoes. Um, and then they've, they've drawn a cable. I think the repeaters are a little bit closer than the repeaters are in reality here. Um, but it kind of gives a view of, of kind of how this avalanche of volcanic material behaved and ran into the cable. 
So we've learned an awful lot about what happened, and actually these, these volcanic flows in many places smoothed out the seafloor. So when asked by uh, Tonga Cable Limited, where should they lay a cable? One, this is probably the best volcano you could lay your cable next to, because it's the one that's not likely to go off anytime soon. This is a one in a thousand year event. But two, it smoothed out the seafloor quite nicely. But we've learned a lot. The stars show the locations from, from OTDR where, where we could kind of locate where the first bit of cable that wasn't damaged from shore was. The dashed lines represent the extent of damage, so we know the flows ran at least that far across the sea floor. But we can take the timing of when materials dumped into the ocean from the volcanic eruption, the timing of the cable breaks and the distance from the volcano to the cable, and then we can start to work out how fast these flows were. No one's ever made measurements of volcanic flows on the seafloor before, so this is a really unique opportunity to do some exciting science. And here, depending on which flow pathway we take, we reach speeds of up to 122 kilometers an hour. So that's just over 70 miles per hour. This thing was going incredibly fast. And even about 80 kilometers away from the volcano where the international cable was damaged, we still have flows that are traveling at up to about 40 or 50 kilometers per hour. So remarkably fast, even faster than those flows in the Congo Canyon offshore West Africa. So for us, this is a scientific first, but it also explains why we had such unusual damage to these seafloor cables. So we were fortuitously able to make measurements of the fastest underwater flows on Earth. And when we compare these to flows that were triggered by underwater landslides or earthquakes or river floods, uh, these are much, much faster. And we think this is because you've basically got a huge flux of very dense material that's fired like a cannon into the ocean. It hits steep slopes of up to about 45 degrees in places. And it finds this sweet spot. This is basically where flows go as fast as they possibly could. So we've discovered here, there were these really dense and fast flows. They traveled for more than 100 kilometers, well out of the survey area that we studied. And, and so you wouldn't want to set a standoff distance and say, right, you avoid these volcanoes with your cables. Um, but a number of lessons have been learned from this project. Certainly getting better, better mapping, and not just mapping the seafloor once, but repeatedly mapping the seafloor will allow us to identify areas that are potentially more hazardous than others, areas where volcanoes or landslides uh, are actually initiating. Monitoring. This is why there was no early warning system. In the South Pacific, deploying instruments offshore is expensive. It's hard to maintain them. So there's really exciting uh, developments in technology that have been driven by this industry uh, to take approaches like distributed acoustic sensing, distributed temperature sensing, um, and to make distributed measurements of strain and also of things like seismicity of volcanic activity using dark fibers um, along seafloor cables. From a routing perspective, there's clearly a need to have more than one cable. There's more and diverse routes and landing points needed. Um, and certainly increased investment for these sorts of systems in, in, in backup low-level satellite communications, particularly if you don't have significant stocks of cable. I do want to stress that volcanic hazards for seafloor cables are a very small percentage of the cable faults that, that happen. But when they happen, they can affect uh, extremely large distances of cables. In the case of Montserrat in 1997 in the Caribbean, uh, the cable landing station was abandoned and completely destroyed by pyroclastic flows. And it was just over 20 years before fiber was reconnected to that island. So these volcanic events like Krakatoa in the 1800s, which damaged the only telegraph cable in the area, can have long lasting impacts. And, and here I just show in stars some of the instances of, of volcanic hazards that have damaged cables around the world, particularly focused on the Caribbean, the South Pacific, but also others around the Azores and, and Indonesia. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say. I know you're all thirsty, um, but I did want to highlight this. So I think this is really neat. I talked about the, the use of distributed acoustic sensing to, to basically create seismic monitoring networks so we can monitor things like early warning for tsunami and earthquakes. 
This is a really exciting data set which is being streamed live now if you use the QR code or just search DAS and Iceland on YouTube. Um, you've got a, a live stream waterfall plot in Iceland that's actually capturing volcanic tremors and earthquakes in real time, which is being used by the scientific community and the local, uh, the local Icelandic government to really try and augment the existing seismic monitoring they have. Uh, and hopefully this sort of system, which can be deployed on a dark fiber, on a commercial system, uh, can now be used to, to really improve uh, disaster warning uh, for, for remote island states and, and indeed around the world. So I think that's all I wanted to say. If you want to catch any more, we've been covered on the BBC News and they did a really nice write-up of it. Um, apologies that Izzy couldn't be here. She's uh, in the middle of the Atlantic uh, drilling hydrothermal vents and submarine volcanoes. So. Uh, far more exciting, I think. Anyway, thank you for your time and thanks for the invite. Thank you, Michael. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, I see a couple of hands already over here. Yes. Can we get a microphone over there? Hopefully they've not been saving them up since you <laughs> came off. Yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, in one of your slides, you mentioned around like reason things to improve by uh, increasing low level satellite connectivity. But um, I assume actually during large scale volcanic eruptions, which feels a bit of like a euphemism, but um, surely most satellite systems don't deal very well with thick snow, um, let alone, you know, flying rock. Um, and so surely it takes quite a few days for those systems to even slightly become viable again, because if they can't penetrate snow, they're not going to be able to penetrate rock in the air. For sure. Yeah. And, and it's one of the reasons why it was four days before the, the network could kick in. I think that the challenge was that there just simply wasn't sufficient capacity on that network when it did kick in. But yeah, th there's going to be that issue. And, 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 you know, other issues manifest in other ways for different sorts of hazards. In, in Haiti, for example, when the big earthquake kicked in, I think 2010, a huge amount of land-based infrastructure, towers, etc., were, were affected. There's also other knock-on effects like um, disturbances to, to, to power infrastructure, um, air conditioning units, and those sorts of things by, by ash fall. So volcanic hazards are, are particularly insidious because of, of all the impacts that they can have. Um, just a very quick question. Um, the, I've always been, there's such things as mid-Atlantic ridges and the like. How exactly were we supposed to run fiber cables over effectively an active volcanic ridge? Or perhaps we should ask the person in the middle of the Atlantic who's <laughs> drilling one of them now. Well, I, I think it's a good question. And I, I've, I've been interested because it, it's an active volcanic area, but it tends to be very, very slow, steady activity. So it's not like these big eruptive events. So cables have, have been laid across. I mean, the reason we know about the Mid-Atlantic Ridge in the first place is because of the first telegraph cables that were laid there. They suddenly discovered it was getting shallower in the middle, then it gets a bit deeper further away. Um, for the most part, those cables that have been laid there are incredibly resilient. And, and I think where there have been instances of damage, it mostly relates to abrasion of the cable and interaction with currents than it does to volcanic activity. Um, I, I think I know of one instance anecdotally where there's potentially been the melting of a cable. But whether that actually is a shunt fault and where you've just had abrasion of the outer casing and it kind of looks like it's melted and someone's recorded that uh, because of the short, um, I don't know. But those sorts of volcanic settings, I, I, I think, are pretty benign in the grand scheme of things. Good. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.